Okay, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's uh, afternoon in States and late in the Friday evening here in Europe. And uh, we are have a short presentation and discussion about what to do at homes uh, with children and uh, their mathematical learning. I'm going to switch to my presentation mode and give you a short introduction to this topic. Okay, how to support children's math skills at home. So um, uh, while I'm talking, you can you can leave your message messages uh, uh, and, and questions to the uh, chat and our uh, host will uh, make sure that uh, those questions will be uh, given attention after my presentation. So uh, I'm Pekka Rasanen. Uh, I'm a researcher and principal investigator in Neil Mackey Institute, Finland. And uh, Neil Mackey Institute is, is the leading research and development center uh, in Finland uh, on learning and learning disorders. And uh, it is run by a non-profit foundation and, and reaching uh, 30 years of anniversary this year. And we've been collaborating a long time with the Haskins laboratories, especially in questions of uh, of uh, applications and research on, on literacy and dys dyslexia. But I also work for the uh, city of Helsinki, the capital of Finland. Uh, we have develop developing new systems, how to serve the families, especially families uh, whose children have uh, development or learning disorders. And on the base of uh, this research and clinical experiences, I will say some ideas about about what to do with the kids uh, at homes. If you are interested to learn to know more about math learning and especially the questions of, of difficulties in learning, I recommend you a book which we managed to publish publish last year. It's the International Handbook of Mathematical Learning Difficulties, edited by Anne-Marie Fritsch, uh, Victor Haas and me. And uh, with the help of uh, almost 100 researchers all around, from all around the world, we uh, made a really uh, up-to-date picture about what we really know uh, from the beginning of the life to uh, university universities and, and how the school systems react to mathematical learning difficulties in different parts of the world. Very interesting book. But today's topic is more, more about how to support children's math skills at home. And, and we are trying to, I'm trying to simplify because I have about 15 minutes to talk about this issue. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to simplify it to one big fact which is very often ignored and uh the, and before i reach there uh, we need to discuss shortly about what kind of uh, representations we have what kind of representations the children have uh about the numerical world uh, and how does the brain process so that these things as numbers and math and quantities and we could say that there are uh, four different codes how we represent quantities from early on up till adult life. So, uh, and, and these four codes, I will explain, explain them uh, a little bit more later. Uh, we could say that the first one is a number sense, so some sort of approximate representation of magnitudes. The, the second one is, 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 is different so small sets of, of objects or collections of objects, how we represent uh, the quantities, then we have a verbal code, and then we have a visual code. And all these develop in, in the in little child's head, mind, brain, and step by step, they start to connect these different representations and, and learn a rich representation of the mathematical world. But what is this number sense or approximate code? So this is an interesting process ha happening in the parietal lobes of the human, human brains, but also uh, shared with, with all the animals. So uh, 
it's difficult to explain what it what it what it really really means in practice. But here's an example: you have two trees or uh, apple trees with unknown number of apples. But it's very easy for you to know, uh, see or feel actually sense which tree has more apples. You don't have to count them. You don't have to have an understanding about the exact number of those. But you have this more like a feeling than a knowledge about which tree has more. And when, when the number of the uh, apples in the trees uh, gets uh, closer to each other, so this approximate the same amount, your sense or feeling of, of, of difference uh, disappears and you start guessing. So this is very approximate uh, understanding about how much is how much. And, and this uh, skill actually seems to be more or less inborn. We're born with these skills. And, 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 and all animals which have been studied share the similar kind of representation of approximate magnitudes in their in the representational system. Uh, we don't know whether this numerical sense is, is inborn or is it, does it develop very early on as, as a side effect of how our perceptual system develops. We don't know that yet, but there is a lot of uh, research on these issues going on at the, you know, everywhere in the world. The second, uh, which is a very important part of the early steps of learning the numerical skills, is how children learn to understand small sets of, of collections or objects or, or in fingers is one of those examples. So, so the, the concept of what means five, the fiveness, without any words, so the children learn to understand that we have three, we have two, and when you put these collections together, you get five. So threeness and twoness build up fiveness, uh, and and this is an interesting thing that uh, this is what the kids learn. This is not this is not same way uh, born. We are not born with this kind of understanding, but it develops in our childhood with, with our experience and exploratory behavior, uh, and and it is shared across cultures. For example, Reeve and Butterworth have studied uh, up Oriental tribes in, 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 in Australia, tribes which actually don't have these, uh, this kind of uh, habits like we have, that we count everything. They even lack the, the whole culture of counting. But despite of this, in these cultures, uh, the uh, children do learn similar kinds of understanding about the, the sets and how, how to manipulate the sets and how to understand the relationship between small quantities. The fourth code is verbal code. And uh, we have a lot of mathematical words. So the world is, uh, the world of language is, is, is full of. So we have all kinds of expressions which describe magnitudes or quantities or amounts. Uh, con concepts like a lot, a, a, a little, a huge amount. Uh, we have comparative expressions uh, which are connected to amounts or scales or comparison. Something is big, something is small, something is tall, something is short. Uh, and then we have expressions of exact quantities, which are number words. And number words meaning uh, we pick up by learning, learning the counting order and, and the children learn counting. And the interesting thing is that the children learn counting, the idea of counting very early on. Uh, and it's been shown, re shown recently that, that uh, children, before they are able to count themselves, they already have some sort of an idea of what is the correct counting sequence. So if you are counting like one, two, three, five, seven, six, children or as young as uh, as 18 months one year and a year and a half they are they actually react that there was something wrong in the counting sequence but this vocabulary of counting and vocabulary of of numerical language develops step by step the last code what we have is is the numerical visual numerical symbols 
And typically, in our cultures, we use Hindu Arabic numbers to represent uh, the kind of amounts and quantities. Uh, and uh, the calculations and the whole mathematical system is based ar around these. We have other representations like the Roman, Roman numerals also. And, but in a chi little child's world, they see numbers everywhere. Many of those numbers actually do not have a math real mathematical meaning. For example, bus number five doesn't mean that it's a fifth bus or, or, or that there would be five buses. It's just a code for representing uh, the, the line which, or, or the track which the, the bus is going on. But in most of the cases, there's some connection between the numbers, numbers presented uh, and the and the ordinal or cardinal representation of, of, of numbers. Ordinal meaning that a certain order, like uh, in street address, there is five. It means that it, it's the fifth house in this, this, this street. All five means that there's this collection, this set of five things, for example, which you can count. There are plenty of models uh, how to describe these things uh, these things for formal education and to teachers here is an example uh, which I, I recommend to all, of, uh, to all teachers to read uh, uh, which uh, my colleague Piri Auni and I we have written a working model for educators about what are the key elements of, of, of the early numerical learning at, at school age and in this model, we try to simplify for teachers what are the key concepts and how to assess and how to make sure that in education you have all these rich different aspects of mathematical edu education. But, but there's much less information for parents about what kind of things are important in early development, what are the core skills to teach and how to teach them. If you go to internet, you will find out there's a huge amount of programs and development programs. There are learning games, tens of thousands of learning games, and there are guidebooks, and there's, there are companies who are uh, presenting that you need to train your kids so that your kids will be successful. Uh, and without these, your child will not be the next Einstein. And for the, those parents who are interested, like all parents tend to be interested in the development of their children and the success of their children, that causes a lot of stress. And, and the key question, is it really needed that you have a system, you use some sort of a systematic program or, or you, you give a lot of learning games or tasks for your children? And the answer is very, very simple. So do you really need those? Actually, no, you don't need them. So, uh, and the, the question is, which one is which one is more common, teaching, playing games, or just paying attention? And I will say it's the last one, and I explain you why. So, what is needed at homes? A very simple guidebook. Step one: pay yourself attention to the magnitudes and quantities, numbers, in your own environment. This is the first step, and this, this is something what the parents actually very often ignore, that our world is totally mathematical. There's always a certain amount of something around us. Everything is certain amount. Uh, you can always compare amounts. So there's, everything is mathematical. You can mathematize everything. And if you, wherever you look, you can see mathematics and you can see geometry, you can, you can see numbers everywhere. When you start yourself to see these, this mathematics in, 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 in your environment, in simple, small things, you share this attention with your child and verbalize these quantities. And you can use those four different codes, which is, we were just talking about, how you can verbalize and show and point to, the, to these different quantities. And third, when your child starts to pick up these quantities, uses any of these four codes uh, to describe his or her own environment, react to that with interest. Try to get your child to get excited about 
the mathematics around yourself. Why this is important? This is important because the everyday attention, so everyday informal situations, every situation you, you can have, you can mathematize every single, when you are uh, buttoning your shirt, you can, there is always certain amount of buttons which you can count. And everyday situations is around the child and it every time you you use any of those four codes and pay attention to those with the child it links child's thinking of math directly to their own world so next time when they face the same or look at the same thing they remember the mathematics there using some teaching or or, or if you go to play some learning games that's a separate activity from the everyday life. And it doesn't directly connect the child's own activities. But if you are paying attention to the, uh, to the mathematics while, for example, child is playing alone with the toys, and you mathematize what's happening there, so that there are those three red bricks on two yellow bricks, that means that the, the, the child's own world become mathematized and they start to use those representations you, you presented to the child in their own activities. So, so when you're uh, having these informal situations where you are looking at the world in a mathematical way, you provoke the child's own spontaneous focusing on numerosity and the numerosity meaning amounts, quantities and numbers. And step by step, the children will develop a rich world of representations about numbers and quantities in their old world. And when, when they are able to have these experiences in their everyday life all the time, it means that when the formal education starts, and, and the formal education uses those uh, mostly the verbal and, 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 and visual symbolic codes, the children are able to connect them to those experiences from their own, old, own lives and their own rich representations, which speeds up their own learning. And actually, we have, been, we have studied this kind of phenomena uh, together with, with a research group in, in, in Turku, Turku, Finland, where we study the spontaneous focusing tendency and whether this kind of uh, early spontaneous focusing interest in numerosity and numbers whether it predicts the school learning and, and, and not just the first years, but seven years later at school. And uh, actually, the, the result is very clear. Uh, of course, we know that verbal counting skill at the age, age of six or, or before school age here in Finland, it, it predicts uh, well the later mathematical skills at school age, but also this spontaneous interest towards the numerical world around yourself uh, predicts at least the same, if not more, the later mathematical skill at, at, at age of 12, and, and most probably also much later. So starting from today, my message today for you is uh, do not have stress about not teaching your child any mathematics. Formal teaching at home is not really needed. The, that can be left to the schools and, and, and teachers. And you don't have to have stress if you don't find time to play number games with your child because you don't need to have separate learning sessions if you have other things to do. But more importantly, you just have to concentrate, look at the word differently. And you need to find yourself the numbers hidden everywhere. And then you share this with your child. And this phenomena is called math talk. So next time you're saying to your child that, look how beautiful flowers, you don't say, look how beautiful flowers, but you will say, look, those two flowers, how beautiful they are. And now you have mathematized the world of, world of your own child and your child starts to build their own mathematical representation. So thank you for your interest to this short presentation. Now it is uh, time for questions and answers. OK. 
Okay, our host has given me a couple of questions here already, and uh, I will read the questions and let's see what uh, what those questions are. Uh, at what age do children start to learn math, and at what age should we start teaching mathematics? So the the question uh, is that at what age do children start to learn mathematics? Uh, I was talking about those different codes. The first code, the magnitude representation, seems to be innate. So we have some abilities which we have already when we are born, or they're developing very, very early at the same time our perceptual system develops. So during the first months of our lives. And from that starts a long journey to master the basics of mathematics. Typically, the basics of mathematics, including basic arithmetic, basic geometry, uh, that takes a, a long time. So learning all those codes, the number system, and how to, how to uh, do addition, subtraction, how to compare numerosities, learning different mathematical algorithms, it takes at least uh, 10 years to master the basics of mathematics. So we can say, yes, mathematics is partly innate, but there is a lot of things to learn. For example, key steps in learning, learning uh, mathematics is when your child learns the number symbols and then counting, counting words. First, they learn the words, but they don't really know what those words mean. So they have heard words like seven or eight, and they know that they are, those, those words represent numbers or quantities, but they don't yet really know how much is seven or how much is eight. If you ask the child to give me eight uh, when the child is uh, three years old, they, they may give you more than two or three, but they have no idea how much eight really is. And approximately three and a half years of age, children start to have an understanding that each number word somehow respect, uh, represent certain specific quantity. So they, they start to develop some cardinal understanding of the number symbols. And from that, step by step, they develop uh, the uh, more and more numbers. First, they learn how much is three. Then they understand what is four and five and so on. So it, it, it is not one happening, one heureka, where they develop the math skills, but it develops gradually. And what age should you start teaching mathematics? Uh, there's a lot of opinions about what, uh, when to start the formal education. In, in the world, we have at the moment uh, very, very different systems. Here in Nordic countries, uh, we try to avoid formal education of mathematics till, at, till school age. And here, the school, here in Finland, for example, the school starts very late uh, at age of seven. And we don't have formal mathematics education before that. In Southern European countries and, and, and many countries which, are, which have a curriculum-based early education, the mathematics education starts much, much earlier. And actually, starting earlier, it doesn't always mean that these, uh, the results for learning are better. So we don't actually know what's the, what's the good age, a perfect age for, for uh, starting formal education. But when we talk about informal training, learning to know, learning the mathematical world and, and doing math talk, uh, the best time to start it is when the child is born. Uh, all math, math talk, 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 talking about uh, concepts which the child doesn't know yet, it is not a bad thing for a child because the more experience is about, more the children hear about those numbers, the easier it will be later to start to connect different uh, representations, different words and concepts uh, to each other. So basically, we start learning, and informal training can start from the very beginning. Ah, then there's a very interesting thing. What to do if math is difficult for parents? Uh, 
when you when you talk about math talk and everyday everyday uh, math, mathematics in everyday life uh, it is a very good thing that the parents who have struggled with mathematics at school uh, mathematics at school and they have very very bad experiences about it. even some sometimes even anxiety or trauma about mathematics uh, it is very good for par these parents too to see that around them in, in, in their lives there's a huge amount of mathematics they are able to do and, and, and mathematics which is uh, reachable for them because you know the counting words, you know uh, the, the symbols and you are able to do, you, you most probably you have some understanding uh, about the clock, you have some understanding about the money and, and the symbols represented in those. Even with small, uh, small uh, amounts of mathematical skills, you will find out that the, the mathematical world around you is understandable. And you can help your child to build a rich world of mathematics, even though the parent, uh, him or herself, knows only the very basics of mathematics and uh, you can do that without connecting that to your uh, bad experiences at school school what you had yourself and this is the way how you can inject vaccinate your child against uh, bad experiences that, uh, themselves at school age uh, the next question was what to do when a teenager says that math is boring and he, and he or she doesn't need it. Uh, here again, uh, what the parents can do is just try to show how mathematical the world is. Uh, very often I use this kind of an example, that I will take the day's newspaper, ask, ask the teenager to join me to read it. Uh, you can go to a, a a journal in, in internet or if you have a paper and pencil uh, daily paper or newspaper and start reading the articles in uh, in that journal and you will find out that most of the articles understanding those articles is totally dependent on whether you have basic understanding about mathematics in most of the news the news itself the, 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 the content of the why this story has been written, very often it is connected to mathematics. There is certain amount of something or the amount has changed. And that's why this is important because something has changed in amount or in, in this scale, some, uh, the, the news describes something in certain scale. And then you have to have a basic understanding of mathematics and mathematical representations to understand that whether a certain amount is large or small, whether it's meaningful uh, to be concerned, whether it's meaningful to be happy about something, some changes. You need to be uh, mathematical to understand the basic news, what we have in the world, and to participate that way to our society, to have opinions which are based on facts, uh, which are based on the, uh, the information around us. That's why every child should have the uh, rights to become numerate so that they can participate in this information society and have their and make their own opinions. Then there's a question is the how do you best support a child with language-based learning disability in math, word problems, etc.? Uh, again, I go back to these uh, math talk. Children who have uh, language-based learning disabilities, uh, they require a very rich uh, language environment around them, and espe especially a lot of repetitions. So this math talk approach 
at home supports the best of uh, those children who have language-based learning disabilities. But uh, because representing things via language is difficult, it is very important to remember that we have uh, three other codes of numerical representations. And combining the uh, math talk to these different representations will make the representations of these children um, much richer, um, meaning that they will, even though they have language problems, they always have some representations about quantities and the changes and the arithmetic and, and the basic concepts in mathematics. So even though the children have language problems, math talk using different representational codes is very important. The next, next question is, can you treat dyscalculia? Uh, dyscalculia uh, is, a, is a concept uh, which is a cousin to this reading disability uh, concept, which is dyslexia. So dyscalculia means that you have extensive and persistent difficulties in learning the basic mathematics. And the question is, can you treat dyscalculia? The answer is, uh, yes. Uh, whether the child with, with a diagnosed dyscalculia can reach the levels of average performance, uh, we don't know that yet. We, we have a, not enough experience about, about different intervention methods. But definitely, even though you have dyscalculia, you can develop a lot. And uh, uh, we can see that, for example, from the international comparison studies like PISA or TIMS, where we, we see how in different educational cultures, the children, uh, of, if we take the poor performers, actually in different countries perform at very different levels. In high performing countries like Singapore or other Asian countries or, or Finland, Netherlands, Denmark, we can see that the children who are who are at the bottom of the of the learning curve, uh, they still master mathematics extremely well compared to the children uh, from countries which are not performing well in these in international comparison studies. So even those with dyscalculia are able to develop very good mathematical skills, and they can even be excited about mathematics if the educational system is ready to give individualized support uh, throughout the school years. Then there's a next question, uh, which is about that how do you just what games are good math games on the internet? This is a very difficult question. Uh, because uh, Nowadays, there are tens of thousands of different kinds of games. There are games uh, for mobile phones, games for tablets, games for computers, uh, games which are running on browsers, uh, uh, separate uh, programs. Uh, of course, you can, you can uh, when you start from a good games, the, the best ones uh, usually have some sort of... Uh, scientific base or knowledge base about, about the principles of good education. Most of the games actually are, are not really good in the sense that they don't pay attention to what the child is doing. They are just presenting uh, tasks and problems to the child without really adapting to each individual child. So if you are talking about a good math game, uh, you need to pay attention to whether the game is able to adapt according to the child's performance. And there are different methods how to adapt. The, we can say that there are three main ad, uh, methods of adaption uh, in these games. One is, one is a, 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 we could say that there's a teacher-based, content-based or learner-based adaptation. So teacher-based means that when the child is playing the game and doesn't know what to do or may, makes an error, the game tries to help, tries to teach, shows how to proceed uh, with, in this question. 
The content-based adaptation usually means that if the child fails in one task, it doesn't give harder problems, but it tries to give a little bit easier problems for the child so that the child will master the tasks and, and is able to perform and, and, and do the task at the, the child's own level. The learner-based mo model is the hardest to build up. There are some examples like, like uh, the game Number Race, which you can still find from numberrace.com uh, numberrace website, where the French brain researchers with lead, a lead of Stanislav Dern uh, built up a numerical game which tries to uh, adapt according to this magnitude, uh, magnitude uh, code, which I was talking earlier. So trying to mimic how the child's brain works and how smoothly it, it can represent the numbers and the game adapts according to that. Another good example of a simple free game, uh, in, in the, which is available in, in the internet, is developed by uh, the group in uh, Sweden by Torkel Klinberg, uh, also a brain researcher. And you can find these, uh, these games from a website uh, with uh, uh, cognitionmathers.org. Uh, where the game actually tries to, t uh, at the same time, they tries to help the child to learn the basics and fundamentals of, of the number system and arithmetic. It also gives tasks for, for cognition and working memory. And all, all of these uh, individual games it has, they adapt to the child's performance. So pay attention to what kind of feedback the uh, uh, game gives and whether the game is able to adjust to the child's skill level. That is very important and one of the most important aspects in, in all uh, educational games. The next question is, is math more difficult for dyslexic children? Okay, uh, math, like, I hope you have learned today that there are different codes in, 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 in mathematics and some of those codes are hard for those who are, have dyslexia. So dyslexics have especially difficult difficulties with the verbal code, but they may not have so much difficulties with the visual, the the visual code, or with the collections, or with the approximate magnitude, because those codes are not so dependent on language. Dyslexics usually have difficulties in mathematics. Uh, in the similar things which why they uh, they have difficulties in reading so that uh, the in reading the problem is with the phonetic and, and linguistic representations which are connected to visual verbal associations and that's why for example the first steps of arithmetic or multiplication tables typically are very difficult for dyslexics to learn and that's why, for example, uh, learning multiplication may need some additional steps and, and special educational techniques so that it would be much easier for dyslexic children to learn. But yes, language-based problems are, are, are difficult for dyslexics and especially when the uh, math questions are pr presented as, uh, as, for example, word problems. Uh, but at the same time, Dyslexic children may be uh, extremely good in, in their magnitude representation or in, in their problem solving where, where language is not so much required. The next question is, is learning math the same in all languages? This is an interesting question. Uh, uh, most of the cultures, what we have at the moment, we, we, we share the same kind of, of numerical code. So we are all using this Hindu-Arabic number system. And now, because of the globalization, thanks to this internet and all these, even the educational systems are starting step by step to look alike, because we know more and more about the good ways of teaching and and, and how to reach a better level. So uh, then we have cultures and languages uh, which have totally different representations of, 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 the, 
of the world and there are even even uh, cultures in which language do not have uh, counting words at all so they don't have no words for fiveness or, or tenness or, or ten twelve uh, the, in those cultures they are not needed also uh, in there are differences between languages about how we have uh, built up the verbal representations of, of the number words so for example in English we have teen words in Chinese uh, the verbal representation and the Hindu Arabic representations are much closer to each other and that's why in Chinese language the children tend to learn the counting system much er earlier because they are, the counting repeats it in the same structure so our after 10 there comes 10 and 1 10 and 2 10 and 3 and not 12 13 14 so these small differences in languages they have small effects how children learn the mathematics but the big differences is not big between the languages but it's it's more between the cultures and the educational systems so we may think that it is connected to language but most probably the, all the large differences are connected to differences in how the educational systems uh, function in different parts of, of the world. How much there's support for those children who are struggling with learning, how much there's uh, support for all individualization of education, and how much resources the educational system has, and how well the teacher training is uh, is uh, preparing the teachers to work with different kinds of children with different skill levels. Luckily, there's more and more information uh, all the time uh, about how to teach kids well. And there's also more and more information about what the math talk at homes uh, is and there's more guidance for parents all around the world to learn to do math talk with their kids so the kids are pre better prepared for the school and how and the schools are becoming better and better how to react to the differences individual differences between children at schools and i would predict that after we have uh, returned to lives as they used to be and children are able to go back to schools we are more ready to face these problems because in most parts of the world the teachers have all already also learned new skills and also the parents uh, have seen their children at home doing homeschooling and started to respect more and more the works of the teachers and how uh, much they are working for the benefit of all. Uh, thank you for this discussion. I think uh, the uh, next session of the uh, Haskins webinars will talk about more about the questions of literacy issues, which are also very important in the future of our societies so that we will build more new scientists to work on winning the viruses. Thank you.